Bone continually remodels by growth, reinforcement, and resorption, which means degrading bone. And this process depends on the stress and strain in the tissue. There's an optimal range of stress for maximal strength in bone, and if the bone becomes understressed, such as during bed rest or immobilization, or overstressed, perhaps due to a stress concentration around an implant, the bone can become weaker. Stresses on fractured bone affect the healing, and stress-dependent remodeling affects surgical implant and prosthesis design, for example, the design of fracture fixation plates, surgical screws, and artificial joints. In 1978, for example, radiographic evidence of bone resorption, that means bone being eaten away around uh, hip implants, was seen in 70% of patients. And that led to the development of new and improved uh, implant materials, implantation procedures, and particular bone cements to uh, distribute the stresses and reduce stress concentrations around the hip implant. Stress-dependent remodeling is caused by the osteoclasts, the cells which are responsible for bone resorption, and the osteoblasts, the cells that are responsible for bone growth or hypertrophy. Compressive stresses stimulate the formation of new bone and are important for fracture healing. That's why it's important that immobilized bones during healing are allowed to have some load on them. And the loss of normal stresses leads to a loss of calcium and reduced bone density, which is a major problem in prolonged space flight. Bone remodeling occurs over a wide range of time scales. The fastest remodeling is changes of mineral content and bone density and healing, which are on the order of weeks. Remodeling of bone structure, such as trabecular structure, takes on the order of months to years, and growth and maturation takes years to decades. There are two types of bone remodeling. The first is surface or external remodeling, which results in a change in bone shape and or dimensions by the deposition on or resorption of bone material from the inner or outer surfaces of the bone. Internal remodeling is a change in the bulk density of the bone, the trabecular size of the bone, the orientation of the bone compartments, or the osteon size, or other properties of the bone structure that affects its mechanical properties. A useful concept in bone remodeling is that of functional adaptation and optimal design. The principle of functional adaptation was first described by Roux in 1895 as the ability of organs and cells, tissues, and organisms to adapt their capacity to function in response to altered demands by what he called practice. Functional adaptation in bone is remodeling of the structure, shape, and mechanical properties in response to altered mechanical loading. Functional remodeling is closely related to the engineering concept of optimal design. For example, the theory of uniform strength attempts to produce the same maximum stress, either normal stress in a brittle material or shear stress in a ductile material, throughout the body for a specific condition of loading. Here, for example, we see a cantilever beam where the cross section decreases towards the end, thereby keeping the maximum stress the same throughout the length of the beam. The principle of maximum minimum design maximizes one property such as strength to minimize another such as weight or in biological tissues metabolic cost. So here for example we see a optimal beam cross-section design where we get high bending rigidity for low mass. And finally the theory of trajectorial architecture is an optimal design strategy that concentrates materials along the paths of force transmission, such as the lines of principal stress. So here, for example, we see a Kevlar mylar composite sails in which the Kevlar fibers are laid down on the mylar to follow the lines of the axes of the principal stresses. The internal remodeling of trabecular bone has been studied for a long time. Here is a picture of a cross-section of the human femur at the metaphyses. And you can see that the trabecular structure forms a pattern. 
And that pattern looks somewhat similar to the pattern of principal stress axes that Kuhlman had drawn in an engineering paper analyzing the mechanics of this crane structure. In 1870, Wolf drew out these principal axes that he thought could be the principal stress axes for human long bone and noticed that this pattern corresponded with the pattern formed by the trabeculi in the trabecular bone. So this led Wolf in 1872 to conclude that when the loads are changed by trauma or a change in activity, that functional remodeling may reorient the bone trabeculi so that they align with the new principal stress axes. Although he never formally proved this, it didn't stop him from stating his law of bone transformation in 1884, that there is a perfect mathematical correspondence between the structure of cancellous bone in proximal femur and Kuhlman's trajectories. Later studies in the 1950s using an experimental technique called photoelasticity did confirm that the principal stress axes in the femoral head of a long bone coincided quite closely with the trabecular architecture of the bone. And Wolf's Law is now recognized as a mechanism for bone remodeling in conditions such as in tennis players whose racket holding arm becomes stronger than the non-racket holding arm, and in weightlifters who often display increases in bone density in response to their training. There have been a variety of theories for bone remodeling developed, and they all make assumptions similar to these. First, the bone is a linearly elastic, porous solid consisting of matrix, minerals, and cells. The bone solid is perfused with a fluid either interstitial fluid or blood, that can be converted to or from solid by the cells, and only the solid affects the mechanical properties. Mass transfer to or from the bone matrix is slow compared with the time scale of normal mechanical loading. And inertial and other dynamic mechanical effects can be ignored. This is what we would call a quasi-static analysis. So clearly a theory of bone growth or remodeling must be time dependent, but the time scales are slow enough that time dependent mechanical processes such as inertial forces are negligible, can be ignored. The rates of addition and subtraction of solid mass at a point depend on the stress or the strain, or in some theories, the strain energy. And the difference between surface or external and internal remodeling is represented by where the solid mass is added or removed. So let's look at an example of the theory of surface remodeling. Solid is added or removed only at the boundary surfaces and the mass additional removal to or from the bone solid only changes the size and or shape of the bone, not its mechanical properties. The bone interior bulk density is unchanged and the rate of mass addition or removal at a point is a function of the stress, strain, or strain energy at that point. There's a growth equilibrium stress, strain, or strain energy at which the rate of change of mass is zero. In the theory of internal remodeling, the solid addition or removal occurs everywhere throughout the porous bone. The mass is added or removed by altering the bulk density through changes in bone porosity, mineral content, etc. The exterior bone dimensions are constant, and the rate of change of density at a point is a function of stress, strain, or strain energy at that point. There is similarly a remodeling equilibrium stress, strain, or strain energy at which the rate of change of density is zero. In this example, we'll look at the problem of surface remodeling of the diaphysis or shaft of a long bone. The long bone is approximated as a hollow cylindrical shaft with inner radius A and outer radius B, both of which vary as a function of time during the growth, and they are subjected to compressive load P that is related to the axial stress TZZ by minus pi times b squared minus a squared, where pi b squared minus a squared is the cross-sectional area, and the minus sign is because the axial stress is compressive. In linear elasticity, the axial stress Tzz is proportional to the axial strain epsilon Zz by the Young's modulus 
E and is the only non-zero stress component in this problem. The periosteal remodeling rate, or the rate at which the bone outer diameter changes, dBdt, is proportional to epsilon zz, the compressive strain, minus epsilon zz naught, the growth equilibrium strain. So in other words, when the compressive axial strain is equal to epsilon zz naught, then there's no remodeling. Similarly, the inner radius, DADT, its rate of change represents the endosteal remodeling rate, and that is also proportional to the difference between the axial strain, epsilon zz, and the growth equilibrium strain, epsilon zz naught. The coefficients RP and RE represent the strain-dependent rates of periosteal and endosteal remodeling and are constants. Now notice the minus signs here and here. That's because the axial stress, TZZ, is compressive, which means that the axial strain, EZZ, is compressive and therefore negative. And so an increase in the load P would make EZZ more negative, which would, with this minus sign, result in an increase in the outer diameter B, which would therefore increase the cross-sectional area, thereby tending to return the stress and the strain back to normal. Now we have an additional minus sign here because a decrease in the inner radius is similar to an increase in the outer radius in that it gives rise to an increase in the cross-sectional area. So here are the equations we just saw. Now, making use of the stress-strain relation, where epsilon zz is tzz over e, therefore epsilon zz naught is tzz naught over e, where tzz naught is the remodeling equilibrium stress. The stress is minus p, the load, over the area, pi b squared minus a squared, and is homogeneous, meaning it's the same everywhere. So now, using these relations, we can rewrite our periosteal and endosteal remodeling rates as dBdt equals Rp over E times P over pi B squared minus A squared plus Tzz0. And dADt is equal to minus Re over E times the same term, P over pi B squared minus A squared plus Tzz0. So what we have here are two nonlinear ordinary differential equations for A and B as functions of time for a given load P subject to initial conditions B0 and A0 at time t equals zero. We would need to solve these equations numerically and the result would depend very much on the load, the initial geometry, the endosteal and periosteal remodeling rates, the Young's modulus, and the growth equilibrium stress. So in fact, doing this, people have found that there are actually eight different steady state solutions for A infinity and B infinity at remodeling equilibrium. So that means the solution of the problem as time tends to infinity and a new equilibrium is reached. These solutions depend on, as we expect, the load P, the Young's modulus E, the remodeling rate constants, RP and RE, and the initial conditions and the growth equilibrium stress. Some of these solutions are fairly intuitive. For example, in this case three, A infinity is less than A naught and B infinity is greater than B naught, resulting in an increase in cross-sectional area. So this would be consistent with positive periosteal and endosteal remodeling rates and an increase in load such that the inner radius decreases, the outer radius increases, and the cross-sectional area would increase until the stress had returned to the original remodeling equilibrium stress, TZZ0. Similarly, this case 1 makes sense, where now A infinity is greater than A0 and B infinity is less than A0. In other words, the inner diameter is greater than it started, the outer diameter is smaller than it started, and the area has decreased. And this would be consistent with positive endosteal and periosteal remodeling rates and a decrease in the load such that the strain and stress would decrease, the cross-sectional area would decrease until the stress and strain were returned to normal at the new growth equilibrium.
However, there are other results that uh, are less expected depending on particular choices of parameters, such as this one where a infinity is greater than a naught, so the inner radius and the outer radius both increase, which could result in an increase or a decrease in the cross-sectional area. And even cases where a infinity is zero, meaning that the hollow bone becomes completely solid. So it turns out that a number of these cases have been seen in different clinical or experimental conditions, and so these can be used to determine which combinations of material parameters uh, may be realistic for modeling growth and remodeling of bone in vivo. So to summarize the key points of bone growth and remodeling, we looked at some historical principles such as functional adaptation and the engineering concept of optimal design, such as Wolf's law of trajectorial architecture. And we looked at the two different types of bone remodeling, external remodeling, which involved changes in bone geometry, and internal remodeling, which involved changes in bone density or trabecular architecture, and hence changes in strength or stiffness. There are a number of different types of remodeling laws that have been used in models. Um, we looked at one, but others include a principal stress-dependent internal trabecular remodeling, which is an adaptation of Wolf's Law, a strain-dependent surface remodeling, this was the case that we just looked at, first proposed by Cowan, uh, and others have used strain energy or work-dependent remodeling of bone density, particularly Carter at Stanford did this. This whole field of modeling tissue remodeling sets biomechanics apart from the rest of engineering mechanics and is often referred to as mechanobiology and investigators are developing new and improved laws for tissue growth and remodeling all the time and this is an active area and a growing area of biomechanics.